If British Leyland had a pound for every mini reboot, they'd still be in business. Ever since it burst on the scene in 1959, designers have been trying to reimagine it for a new era. In the process, their failure has made the shape of the original Mini a British cultural icon, like the red telephone box, the Beatles, or England losing to Germany at football. So why did it take 41 years until we got a new Mini, when it would have made sense to keep updating the car that was selling so well? This is the story of the many, many failed Mini reboots. The British Motor Corporation, or BMC, released the Morris Mini Minor in 1959 and quickly found that they had a hit on their hands. The new car was soon being sold, slightly rebranded, through just about all of BMC's brands – Austin, Morris, Riley, and Wolseley. It would even be produced and sold in Italy by Innocente. The Mini might have been a cute runaway hit, but the design meant it was complicated to produce. Being a small car, BMC couldn't charge a premium for it. This led the company to explore a series of updates by the late 1960s, partly to reduce costs and partly to ensure the goose kept laying the golden egg. Several efforts began around 1967, designed to update the Mini for the 1970s. Pininfarina showed two futuristic reworkings of the Austin 1100 and 1800 at the London Motor Show in 1967. Although these were just concepts, it seemed a few people at Longbridge felt the Mini could get a similar treatment, using the longer Mini van chassis. This may have been conceived while the Pininfarina models were being considered for production, and BMC was looking for a coordinated look for all of its cars. But with Alec Isagonis, the designer of the original Mini, still running the design show at BMC, the idea that Pininfarina-styled cars could muscle in on the action was a non-starter. He'd been unhappy with the compromises made with the original car, and requested he step down as lead designer so he could focus all of his efforts on making a better Mini. This would be his new baby, the Godfather Part 2 to the Mini's Godfather. Everything was new about the car. The 1950s A-series engine was out, replaced with a clean sheet design, the four-cylinder DX engine. Between 750 and 1000 cc's, it developed 50% more power than the old engine, and was modular so could be expanded to a six-cylinder for BMC's larger cars. The existing A-series engine had the gearbox underneath, which was noisy and limited major changes. A lighter gearbox was designed for the new engine that fitted on the side. BMC was in love with its hydroelastic hydropneumatic suspension, but although it had been tried on the original Mini, it hadn't worked, so the new Mini would use a simple, cheaper standard suspension setup. The chassis would be all new, and it produced a car that was shorter, yet bigger inside, and lighter to boot. With the existing Mini being expensive to manufacture, the mantra around the new car was simplicity. There were almost half the components of the original car, and it was designed to be easier to maintain to boot. Although Isagonis wasn't a fan, he allowed the car to be a more practical hatchback. The styling was done by in-house BMC engineers, with a little help from Pininfarina, who would also style the similar Peugeot 104 a few years later. This took the Mini's practicality to the next level, and Isagonis was keen to move it into production. BMC was desperate to get the top automotive talent to keep their cars selling, and one big signing was Roy Haynes, designer of the Mark II Ford Cortina that was already becoming a top seller. One of his first jobs was to restyle the top of the range Minis, the Riley Elf and the Wolseley Hornet, while making a car that was cheaper to produce. He worked with Paul Hughes, another Ford transplant, to come up with an updated interior that did away with the big speedometer in the middle of the car for something more modern. Haynes would update the front of the car, giving it a more mature, serious look, and the longer bonnet allowed for easier servicing. At the same time, he was asked to mock up a larger boot. His solution was to make it slightly longer, and he turned it into a hatchback for easier access. The sides would get vents like the upcoming Morris Marina Coupe that he'd also designed. 
So that's three different efforts to modify the MIDI, all seemingly produced in isolation. All plans for a MIDI replacement were put on hold though, when in 1968, BMC announced that there was no money left and they were being bought out by Leyland Motors. Once the dust settled, the new owners evaluated these three options. Isagonis's 9X was a tempting package, but an all new car and engine would cost too much. The newly created British Leyland had bigger fish to fry. The Mini was selling well, but BMC's larger cars needed improving so that they could reach their sales potential. To stretch my Godfather analogy a bit, if people are still paying week in, week out to watch The Godfather, why make The Godfather Part 2? The BMC 9X would be the last car Alec Isagonis designed, and he retired in 1971. He'd continue working on the 9X Mini replacement on his own into the 1980s, still trying to get British Leyland to take the plunge. The Pininfarina Mini never really got off the drawing board. But Roy Haynes's designs, which used much of the original Mini, had merit, despite the fact that Haynes had had enough of British Leyland just 16 months after he'd joined them. The rear range changes were ditched, but the front end and interior would be used, not as a new Riley or Wolseley, but with those badges being retired, and with the two millionth Mini rolling off the production line, it would become the new Austin Mini Clubman. Not exactly the big mini replacement Isagonis was going for, but money was tight. British Leyland called the mini good and went off to update the rest of their cars that were being attacked by the triple American threat of Ford, General Motors and Chrysler. But although the mini was selling well, it remained an expensive car to manufacture. By the early 1970s, British Leyland started another mini development program. Three sizes were considered, Project Ant, Mini Update, Ladybird, which would be a little bit bigger than the Mini, and Dragonfly, a saloon that was closer to the size of the Ford Escort. Dragonfly, the larger one, was the first to be dropped. The Allegro and Marina would battle Ford's Escort. Project Ant, the smaller prototype, shouldn't be confused with the Austin Ant off-roading prototype. That's another story in itself. The mock-up was a little bit larger than the original car, but with cleaner lines that were simpler and therefore cheaper to manufacture. But the design that was chosen to turn into the next Mini, codenamed ADO74, was the Ladybird. It was clear the car would need to be larger, but how much larger? The design team were given an 86 inch wheelbase, 6 inches longer than the Mini but that got revised upwards to 90 inches, around the same size as the Fiat 127, or about the same size as the future Ford Fiesta. Like Isagonis's BMC 9X, the car would use regular suspension, none of that fancy hydro pneumatic suspension that was seen on the Allegro. It would use a brand new engine though, the K series that was in development, and like the 9X, it would be a hatchback. Italian car designer Giovanni Michelotti, favourite stylist of Triumph, was asked to submit a design, but they preferred a shape penned by BL favourite internal stylist Harris Mann. The car shape was developed, and there was great interest in releasing this new car that didn't seem to have any domestic competition. But the old Leyland side of the business didn't see the potential and pushed to get the project stopped. BL's management had to make a call and ultimately decided not to take it into production. Ironically, the marketing people had asked the development team to make the car larger to help it sell, but management felt it was now too large to be a true mini replacement. Cost was another issue. They estimated it would cost today's equivalent of £1.7 billion, a colossal amount which included the cost of the new engine, and the cash strap BL just couldn't afford it, especially after the new Allegro failed to sell just a year later. British Leyland was hurtling towards bankruptcy, so again the Mini that was still selling well in the 1970s would have to wait for a replacement. Finalmente siamo comodi. E sto comodo anch'io. Innocenti i quattro vi porterà lontano. Italian company Innocenti had been selling BMC cars since the 1960s, and the Mini had become a good seller. So well in fact that they considered making their own more practical hatchback to take on the Fiat 600. They asked for designs from Bettoni and Giovanni Michelotti, but making a whole new car was just too expensive for a small car company, so they went back to manufacturing Austin's original Mini. 
British Leyland subsequently bought Innocente and their new BL appointed manager took another look at Innocente's mini proposal. The new Auto Bianchi A112 and Fiat 127 showed that an update was needed. But with Innocenti now wholly owned by BL, there was no need to create a brand new car. They could reuse the Mini's engine and chassis without needing to pay royalties. And they had a couple of new body designs to choose from. Suddenly, this was looking like an inexpensive way of releasing a major new Mini update. Of the two shapes, Bertoni's design was chosen and the small Italian development team got to work with Innocenti's manager doing his best to hide this skunkworks project from BL's bean counters back in Britain. With a tiny budget, they would do what BMC and BL had been trying to do for over a decade, produce a modern mini update. It was more practical with a hatchback and a folding rear seat. It was more comfortable with a front mounted radiator and better quality seats and it was more modern with a brand new dashboard. The car was launched with much fanfare in 1974 and a choice of 1 litre and 1.3 litre A-series engines. The immediate question back in Britain was would BL start selling it there? Management were cool though, saying that when the Mini was replaced it would be a complete update. And there was some logic in this. The Mini's 80-inch wheelbase was far too small to be a big seller in the mid-1970s and the Innocenti Mini seats gave the car less space than the original Mini. It all became academic though in 1975 when British Leyland went bankrupt and Innocenti would have another owner. In any case, British Leyland, now bailed out by the government to stave off mass unemployment in both Birmingham and Oxford, still held on to the idea of making their own Mini replacement and doing it properly. Almost as soon as the ADO 74 project had been canned, work had begun on ADO 88 and British Leyland managed to convince the government the only path to success lay in finally updating the original Super Mini. ADO 88 would become the Austin Mini Metro and I won't repeat the development story here because I've already made a video about it but there's a link above if you want to learn more. When British Leyland released the Austin Mini Metro in 1980 it seemed we finally had a Mini replacement. But because there was still demand, Mini production continued and rather than demand slowly disappearing, it continued. It seems the public was still in love with the cute looks of the old Mini something they didn't see in the straight-edged Metro. British Leyland, renamed to Austin Rover and then finally to Rover, would continue Mini sales and by the mid-80s they were designing the Metro's successor. But the same money problems that hit the Mini replacement also hit the Metro replacement and it soldiered on with only a small update in 1990 that finally gave it the long overdue K-series engine designed for the ADO 74 project way back in 1972. The love for the Mini with all of its shortcomings had never really gone away. So in the early 1990s, thoughts again turned towards a Mini replacement. The first rumbling started in 1992 with the Minky project, so-called because it was a regular Mini with a new K-series engine. The team didn't mess around with the body. The Mini sold on its classic looks, but they would improve the handling with the Metro's hydrogas suspension and a split fold tailgate to make the car more practical. New seats and steering column fixed the driving position that had plagued the car since its launch. An instrument panel from the Honda Beat motorbike completed the updated interior. They were having problems with the K-series engine that wouldn't fit and even tried a three-cylinder version, so they eventually had to give in and put the A-series engine back in. But it was all too expensive given the relatively limited sales the Mini was getting at this point. Rover would give Mini fans some cheer with a convertible version in 1993, but it would take a new owner to put some life into the reimagining of the Mini. BMW purchased Rover in 1994 and it soon became clear the current Mini wasn't long for this world. The new car would soon fail increasingly stringent safety tests and the engine would fall foul of emissions regulations. Brits wouldn't take kindly to the Germans killing off their beloved Mini and in any case there was a good chance the new Mini, if done right, could sell well. With the Metro being in the same position as the Mini, making one new car to replace both of them made a lot of sense. 
And in any case, the reason BMW had bought Rover in the first place was to get into the mass market, so a larger Mini replacement was made a top priority. The Minky team worked on a follow-up, this time getting the full four-cylinder K-series engine to fit by cutting the car in two, and like the Morris Minor, widening the car just a smidge. It was also cut in four behind the front seats to make it a little longer. The Minky was all well and good, but BMW needed a complete redesign of the classic car to satisfy upcoming safety legislation, a new shape to take the car into the 21st century. Rover stylists have been sketching new Minis since 1993, producing designs that took inspiration less from the Mini's original shape and more in the radical experimentation behind it. The underpinnings would be less radical though, using the tried and tested K-series engine and hydrogas suspension from the Metro. BMW's engineers were looking at the Mini in a very different way though. The Porsche 911 shape had evolved over 30 years, so what would the Mini have looked like if it had evolved in a similar way? The decision on the next Mini came to a head when all Rovers and BMW's designs were evaluated in October of 1995. Rover bought three designs, including one that had two sizes that Rover's engineers had dubbed the Mini and the Midi. One German engineer asked why the Midi hadn't been called the Maxi. The Rover engineers had a good laugh about that and then explained why. BMW brought somewhere between three and six designs. In the end, BMW's management decided on a BMW design, and the cast was set. Work began on what would become the new Mini that would launch in 2000. And when I make a video about that car, I'll put a link above. The Mini and Midi designs from Rover would get an outing at the 1997 Geneva Motor Show as the Mini Spiritual and Spiritual 2 concepts, and BMW would offer a sporty version of the Mini as the ACV30 concept the same year, based on the MGF chassis. Mini production ended at Longbridge in 2000, just before production of the new car started at Cowley. The old car would outlast its replacement, the Mini Metro, by two years. The Mini was a victim of its own success. It sold so well that BMC and British Leyland always had other fires that needed fighting, and the Mini replacement kept getting pushed off. Hello, Sam. Oh, what's this? Studio cut the budget again, eh? Gosh, this takes me back a bit. I used to love my old Mini. The Mini was such a beloved shape, it went through the awkward middle years when cars can go out of fashion to emerge on the other side as a classic. This also happened to the Land Rover for much the same reasons, a lack of money to fund a replacement. Despite the protestations of die-hard Mini fans, the BMW Mini design has gone on to be an even bigger hit than the original. Quite an achievement. Even Mrs. Big Car has one. Like Francis Ford Coppola, BMW has managed to produce a second act that's even more popular than the beloved original. But at 41 years between cars, it's taken a little bit longer than it took The Godfather Part 2 to arrive. With British Leyland's blessing, William Town showed off his vision of the new Mini as the Town's car at the 1973 British Motor Show. It was even shorter than the original Mini, but with mod cons like an automatic gearbox. BL loved it so much they bought the design and patented it. The concept reappeared in the 1980s as the Ellswick Envoy, a seemingly ideal car for wheelchair users. 